train. As Matt said, my name is Stacy Mervin. I'm the chief strategist for the electronic warfare mission area. I am here today um, representing Mr. Zahid Din, who is our department director for Spectrum Warfare Systems Department, and Ms. Erica White, who's our deputy department director for the Spectrum Warfare Systems Department. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to share with you a little bit about what we do in Spectrum Warfare Systems Department and what the electronic warfare mission area is all about. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about what are our technology gaps and what kind of skill sets and what kind of support do we need from all of our fine industry partners to remain relevant and continue to propel the EW mission area into the future. So just a little bit of background about um, Spectrum Warfare Systems Department. We're about 1,200 government employees who are focused on electronic warfare or electromagnetic spectrum warfare operations. And so within this element, we have 1,100 government employees and about 500 contractors currently supporting the mission area. We've historically been recognized and continue to the to this day being the, the NAVC Center of Excellence for Electronic Warfare, one of the centers. And as you can see in our strategic goal for the mission area, we are elevating our game. Um, we wanna elevate that strategic goal to be leaders across the DOD in force level, or some call it joint, electromagnetic warfare. And want to be able to influence those bigger operational concepts and really influence and drive how the DOD across the services is using electromagnetic warfare to create those multi-domain and full spectrum EW solutions to provide that spectrum advantage. So as a result today, it's really exciting to talk with you all. We want to get the word out to the broader ecosystem, to industry partners like yourselves, who will be a critical component to helping us achieve this goal. We will still need our traditional support that we've always um, traditionally used in the past, but in addition, we're looking for access to that next level talent that in some cases doesn't always reside within the government to help us propel. So we're gonna be looking outside of government to people like yourselves to complement and augment our capabilities in order to provide us with the ability um, to move faster as national leaders in electronic warfare. So what this slide is conveying, and you all uh, may or may not know, the distributed maritime operations and the USMC Commandant's guidance, when you look at that and expeditionary advanced basing operations, you look at all of the strategic guidance coming out of DOD senior leaders, out of our COCOMs, out of our CNO, they're all asking for that distributed integrated force level EW. They want those platforms talking across each other. They want integrated sensors. They, they want um, situational awareness at their fingertips. And then also not only just knowing what's out there, but integrated with that distributed lethality and able to deliver some kind of long range capability to, to um, target and engage with the threat and, and those things. So basically when you look at Crane, why Crane? Why do we think we can be that joint um, EW leader for the DOD? We already do multi-domain electronic warfare. We also do multi-spectral, we do multi-service. Multi so we not only support the Navy currently at Crane, but we also have um, Marine Corps and Air Force that we support. We're also looking and leveraging what we call the Naval Innovation Science and Engineering, where we're trying to get out in front of um, just chasing threats in electronic warfare. We're looking at those left of the life cycle R&D research and development looking at cognitive and distributed non-kinetic system as systems, as well as looking at non-conventional ways, non-traditional ways of using electromagnetic warfare or electromagnetic spectrum operations to provide offensive and disruptive concepts and technologies. Of course, all of this requires, as I said, a strong collaborative partnership across the Naval Research Development Enterprise and the Air Force Research Labs, as well as Army Research Labs. So this is where we're moving in electronic warfare. We're really looking at that multi-domain, multi-platform capability. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, a little bit about what you probably traditionally know about the Spectrum Warfare Systems Department. Um, the workforce is working across the full life cycle in air surface ground domains and like we talked previously we're looking at full spectrum so not only do we look at rf 
between EW and radar technologies, but we're also looking at infrared countermeasures and the EOIR kinds of countermeasures required as the threats evolve to multispectral. So as such, um, the, the near-peer competitors that we're up against today, their capabilities are evolving quickly. And so in addition to all these traditional capabilities that we have in RF and EOIR, we're really looking at how can we come to the table with game-changing, quicker, more agile solutions. And so as a result of um, in the last 18 months, two years, we've stood up a new division. So we used to be five divisions across spectrum, you know, very domain focused. So we had the Maritime EW Systems Division. We have the Airborne Electronic Attack Systems Division. We have the RF Technologies, Radar Technologies Division, Infrared Countermeasures, and then the expeditionary EW. But what we found was because we know we've got to be multi-domain and integrated across all those domains of warfare, we created a, what we call the Electromagnetic Warfare Science and Technology Division. And they're really chartered to look at those cross-domain integrated capabilities. What are those advanced concepts that we need to be moving forward? They're also looking at how we can do things um, disrupt, be disruptive and more um, agile in what we're able to provide looking at even unmanned capabilities or new payloads of sorts. So you can imagine that as we're sustaining and maintaining what we have fielded and traditionally supported for decades here at NSWC Crane, we're really building off of that multi-domain capability. And so looking at things like in different contract vehicles in addition to like seaport services that we traditionally have had here or those technical repair contracts or technical services kinds of contract vehicles. We're looking at OTAs when you think about rapid prototyping and thinking about agility. Um, so we're looking at some of those other venues as well of how do we quickly address these national needs and get out in front of the problem and leverage the, the collaborative nature and the, the experience and the expertise that's out there in private industry to really advance and bolster capabilities. So traditionally our roles have always been, we're, we're moving more into S&T and research and development, um, design, modeling, simulation, and then of course our traditional roles of in-service engineering, um, sustainment, the configuration management, test and evaluation, and just overarching systems engineering. So that's what Spectrum is about today, and, and you can see that we realize we've got to move forward, and again, that's why I'm excited to talk with you today. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to talk to you more about outside of what we traditionally have always done, again, because the urgency of trying to get to that integrated multi-domain level um, we've really looked at what are those strategic thrust areas, those enabling technologies that we really need to position ourselves and remain relevant in the next five to 10 years. So we've looked at technology enabling thrust areas and we're focusing on modeling and analysis, the mission engineering and apps for EW. Again, building off of our legacy at Crane in all the domains that we've, we've done, the air surface ground, and the spectrum technology focused areas, we have to move to that multi-domain, multi-spectral. And the key is integrating EW and electromagnetic spectrum operations and sensors, those capabilities across platforms integrated with non-kinetic and the kinetic capabilities to deliver distributed lethal effects. With that, when we talk about modeling analysis, so what we're looking at there is what is that joint level, that campaign level modeling um, environment with a focus on more of the modeling and simulation. And if you've heard of live virtual constructive evaluation and assessment capabilities and why that's so critical and why we're really putting a lot more emphasis on it is if you can imagine in the digital engineering environment, if we can do testing, evaluation, assessment of concepts, there's a lot of advantage to that versus going in the open air testing. Um, so being able to leverage through networks, national test networks and leveraging with those national experts, we're able to basically um, recreate those joint scenarios and, and run different joint concepts of operations using 
integrated sensors, whether it's radar, EOIR, EW, things of that nature, and really play um, and look at integration and interoperability, we can buy down risk and, and connect with all those national experts and, and play out the, the scenarios before we go to live experimentation. So we're finding this is really picking up and we definitely want to continue to grow our live virtual constructive capability. Model-based systems engineering comes into play as well as high fidelity threat models that we can really create in that virtual constructive environment the contested and congested um, electromagnetic spectrum environment. So that's one of our areas. And then moving to the middle, looking at mission engineering, we're really looking at leveraging the modeling and analysis to do that mission level campaign um, analysis and engineering and also factor in, OK, can, can I use different unmanned capabilities, manned, unmanned teaming? You know, what are those different things that we could play through and, and really bring and drive and influence tactics, technique, procedures, you know, new con ops for joint war fighting concepts, things of that nature. And then as I keep moving to the right, apps for EW. So as we all know, technology is evolving pretty quickly. We also know that the threat doesn't stand still. So we're really looking at how do we leverage um, the EW and electromagnetic systems to be more and more software defined. So you probably hear a lot about multifunction EW. And so as we find that, again, as technology is evolving, the hardware is becoming less and less that you're going to see more of multi aperture capabilities that are more software defined and hardware agnostic. So we're really trying to figure out how do we get into that game? How do we get the, the workforce um, developed and, and thinking in these natures? So if you can also imagine they're asking for a lot of um, battle decision aids and battle space awareness. So things like sensor fusion, AI enabled decision making comes into play. And as I already mentioned, those multifunctional EMS apertures, they're the, they're the future. And so we've definitely got to embrace this and keep moving forward um, through these technology enabling areas. Foundationally, spectrum science is at the heart of everything we do. So physics, RF, you know, the, the different the different variations of the spectrum, the, those are critical as we move forward into the future as well. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to kind of hit on. Again, part of uh, part of what we're really pushing for and Crane is, as I mentioned earlier, is a NAVC center of excellence and then pushing forward to leveraging what we do for the Navy and EW, looking at the joint war fighting concepts. Um, the national leadership is so critical. And so if you could go back one, Rachel, I'm sorry. There we go. So as you look at the national leadership in EW, we continue to grow. These focus areas have really helped us propel ourselves as a leader. And because we are a recognized leader in the Navy for EW, we have the SSTM, Mr. Tom Dalheim, that's really responsible for leading across the Naval Surface Warfare Centers, all those EW advancements and the transformation. Um, for us to continue to grow national leadership, we have to continue building our team of experts. Again, that's why it's exciting to talk with you today because not just internally do we need to grow our own government workforce, but we need that collaborative um, and ecosystem of industry partners such as yourselves that form that collaborative partnership across numerous DOD labs and also stakeholder offices. So not only is our government workforce key to helping it push forward these areas that we're leaders in, but we also put people in offsite positions. Again, stakeholder adv advocacy is key because if we're going to influence at the joint level, we want to do that. But more importantly, we have to have the expertise behind those thrust areas and what we are are known for nationally to be able to be leaders. So you can see um, the thrust areas I just talked about on the previous slide were gaining momentum. So as we evolve our capability and grow our teams required, that technical depth is important. So you can see that we have established ourselves and are recognized as a key leader in the Navy for live virtual constructive environments. We need to continue evolving that capability, but you can tell that we've really um, established a foundation to be successful in the future. Again, enabling that joint electronic warfare, electromagnetic warfare 
mission analysis environment. The other thing, as we've been able to leverage our NICE, our internal IRAD research and development funding, we have become very much a, a significant technical supporter for places like DARPA and ONR and cognitive electronic warfare or AI enabled EW, which is critical. Um, and we also lead several OSD studies related to cognitive EW. The other thing is with the recent stand up in, of the PMS 406 and the unmanned capabilities for the surface Navy, we are also just recently designated as the technical direction agent and ISEA and service engineering agent for EW mission payloads on USVs. So those are all critical things as we move forward into the future. Next slide, please. So with electronic warfare, um, there was recently a joint pub that came out. Um, it's the GEMSO, Joint Electromagnetic Spectrum Operations, and it's a joint pub 3-85. EW is now becoming a lot more um, encompassed within this broader capability of electromagnetic spectrum operations. So electronic warfare as we traditionally know it, plus spectrum management. So what are the gaps? So right now we're really, we're becoming very um, aware as we think through trusted EW, a trusted industrial base. So that's what IBAS stands for, um, the MINSEC or RF, optoelectronics um, area is really underneath that trusted and assured microelectronics that NSWC Crane supports OSD in. But we're finding, and, and I think we all know, reading the news and watching, we have got to be a lot more cognizant of the supply chain when it comes to our um, weapon systems and capabilities of what we're fielding to the warfighter. The other thing with us knowing that we're trying to do AI enabled EW, well, vice versa, cognitive security. So how do we do counter AI ML to us and how can we recognize it's happening? We're going to grow in this area. 5G, I think you all are familiar. We all have that little thing in our fingertips or the palm of our hand called a phone. We have got to look at how those wireless technologies and Internet of Things are going to change war fighting for the future. So that's a big area we got to pay attention to. Electromagnetic protection. Um, this is expanding into that battle space awareness and also dynamic spectrum access of how do we become more agile in our communication links and as well as our sensing capabilities to make sure we have access to the spectrum. RF enabled cyber, cyber is another area that we're really looking to grow in. Um, cyber and EW are converging more and more and there's opportunity for us to grow there. I've mentioned unmanned capabilities, so we're also very interested in any help and, uh, and capabilities to get to scalable EW systems. And we've leveraged the OTA, which is the SMARTS OTA for the last um, year or two and looking at payload prototyping. So again, scalable EW systems in line with that agility and getting into providing capabilities that are smaller, attributable, um, are going to be the key to the future. And then as we look at traditional um, pillar of EW or yeah, electromagnetic attack, High power microwave, non lethal directed energy, all those other kinds of non kinetic countermeasures. How do smoke screens work? You know, so those are areas that are traditionally not what we've been looking at over the past couple decades, but we definitely know we're going to grow in these areas. Next slide. So, as you think about um, electronic warfare and, and the technology areas of our future. So I just kind of gave some examples in this slide, but you'll notice a lot of the key words in these slides about what I've just shared with you of where we're moving at Crane and, and the critical capabilities and contributions that we need from from our industry and our, our ecosystem with our academia partners and and then not to mention, you know, collaborating across, like I said, Air Force, Marine Corps and those different areas. How can we use electromagnetic warfare in a different way to where we're able to bring more value and more capability to the kill chain when you think about um, tactical kinds of war fighting? So you think about sensing. So EW, the passive side of it is all about sensing or 
knowing what's out there, um, EOIR, we, we know what's out there. We know that we can start networking ES, electromagnetic support capabilities, and have a tighter and a bigger kill web of sensors so we know exactly what's going on in the electromagnetic spectrum environment. So the other thing would be dynamic sensing, having those sensor networks in the sensing realm, um, LPI, LPD kinds of sensing, because obviously we, NEW want to provide the stealth advantage to where we're passive and not giving away where we are. So very critical in this area. The other part of the future is quantum sensing. So when you think about technology evolving, what other passive sensing or sensing capabilities are going to be the way of the future for us that we need to capitalize a crane? Then the targeting piece. So I'm pretty sure you probably heard my counterpart, um, Shannon Kasinger, talking yesterday for expeditionary warfare and the fact that we've got to fuse. We have to fuse our sensors. We have to bring that sensor kill web together and sense what's out there, look for sensors of opportunity, um, do figure out how to do Tar targeting quality perhaps and pass that off to engagement so we can do non-lethal engagement. We may want um, networked electromag electromagnetic attack capabilities. We may want real-time battle damage assessment. Um, again, the unmanned capabilities, how can we do manned unmanned teaming? How does swarm technology play in? So a lot of what we're looking at, distributed effects, advanced electronic attack techniques, those are things that we're going to partner with individuals like yourselves and hoping to get some support and, and help in these areas as we move forward into the future. So next slide. Okay, so I think this is probably the meat of what y'all are interested in seeing. So skill sets needed. Um, on the right side of the slide, you're going to see things like our traditional areas where we have partnered very heavily with industry over the last several decades in electronic warfare, and those are still going to be needs. Um, the, the divisions are always as electronic warfare and spectrum capabilities. We're always going to need those engineering talents of RF engineers, physicists, um, comms and, and digital signal processing. Um, systems engineering, as you think about, you know, we are heavy in supporting programs of record and program offices. So any of those systems engineering capabilities, whether it's from upfront systems um, requirements definitions or test and evaluation kinds of support or any of that or the um, acquisition logistics side, we're always going to need that kind of support at Crane because that's our customer base traditionally. Um, we do a lot of installations, so as a result, I know Maritime is looking at with the new Slick 32 systems that are being introduced to the fleet today, they have a heavy demand for installations. Um, a lot of, uh, lot of work and support needed there. In addition to that, it's not just about services to go out and do installs, it's also about fabrication of those interfacing parts as we think about the platform installation itself. Um, whether it's platforms or integrating hardware, we're going to need fabrication support. And then also with installations becomes the big job of materials kitting. So you're going you're gonna to be seeing the request um, continue and, and the demand signal for Maritime being strong in those areas. Um, the future with Maritime, as you can imagine, is is along the lines of what's on the left hand side. I, they are looking for the model based systems engineering and model based product support. They are as an acquisition engineering agent and support direct to the program office. Those are critical ways of how we're going to do um, product support for the future. Supportability, supportability analysis, predictive analytics. So if you can think about um, big data analytics and how we can use data, sustainment data to our advantage, how do we become more of a predictive analytics capability to know that something's going to fail before it does? That's going to be super critical moving into the future, and we want to leverage the power of um, AI and big data to do better supportability. Um, like all of our other divisions, we're looking at AI on a, and autonomous cognitive al algorithms. You know, we need our, our systems to be more autonomous versus dependent upon a threat library update that can be very timely and not very responsive when the warfighter needs it. 
And of course, the Maritime Group is looking for more live virtual constructive capability. They are the ones that steward the LVC for the department. And so we're looking at people that have understand how to interface hardware in the loop with networks capability and also understands how to do interface requirements messaging. So those are critical areas that they're going to need in the future. For WXQ, we have International J Crew and CVRJ. Again, a lot of looking for RF engineering with that comms and digital signal processing expertise. We need analog and digital circuit expertise and the systems engineering and T&E. For J Crew itself, we're looking at that being, you know, the, the Navy's joint crew program, um, a, a newer acquisition. They're looking at engineers with MATLAB and Python experience, um, combat or um, computer science and software engineers with experience designing and, and programming large complicated software apps. Um, engineering with FPGA and cellular, of course, with the, the ground EW, expeditionary EW, division, they're very interested in that wireless technology aspect, which ties back to 5G and some of those. Where's wireless technology advancing? And of course, AIML expertise is required as well with J.Crew. For WXR, which is our infrared countermeasures group, they're looking for, they can always use the traditional T&E support, tech writers and data analysis kinds of support to support their test and evaluation events as they're doing the research and development and prototyping of new infrared countermeasures technology and directed energy kinds of things. They need to have those um, support um, areas of data analysis and tech writers available from those test events. And of course, they are heavy in research and development. So definitely looking in that area for support as well. WXS, which is our Airborne Electronic Attack Group. They are like you see on the right hand side, a lot of the same thing. We need those RF engineers. Um, we also need program management type support, the repair production and depot support. Radar Technologies Division is the same way. So when you look at that right hand side of this slide, we are traditionally across the divisions within the Spectrum Department are going to need this kind of support and we'll continue reaching out for that. Now moving to the left hand side, as I mentioned earlier, we created a new division WXV. So we have six divisions total in Spectrum Department and they're looking more to the left hand side of the life cycle. So a lot of what they're going to be contracting for, which again, this is our electromagnetic warfare S&T division. They're going to be looking for support in autonomous and cognitive algorithms, AIML. And um, they're looking at their heavy in data science, as you can imagine, big data analytics. They, they're going to need mathematicians to statistics support. They are leading our mission engineering for the department. So they're looking at system of systems engineering. So any kinds of advanced analytics capability or support of analysis tools that help us better assess non kinetic effectiveness, they're going to need that kind of support. Um, mission engineering, as you can imagine, having that former operator experience, so someone with operational former military experience is going to be important as we think through how to develop new con ops or as we set up, you know, wargaming or LVC events. We need that kind of support as well as threat analysis. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, cyber is an area that we're wanting to grow in whether it's um, cyber as far as cybersecurity for AIML or RF enabled cyber payloads. Those are things that we're definitely interested in. Quantum science. And then of course, when you think about scalable EW systems and where the future is software defined um, EW and multifunction sensors are going to be the way of the future. So those are just a, that's kind of a summary of where we currently are always going to need, again, on the right hand side, we're always going to need that some level of those support and skill sets required. But as we think about being more agile and thinking about the integrated joint electronic warfare capability, we're really trying to get into more of that mission campaign level and really trying to influence some of those joint warfighting concepts. So, you know, it'll be a mixture of needing seaport services types of contracts, 
our, our technical um, and services and repair contracts like we've always done for depot or repair and production related capabilities. But as we continue to evolve in the future, we're definitely going to be looking at how do we do more rapid prototyping? So that's where that OTA and again, we're we've been leveraging the SMARTS OTA and of course there are other OTAs that some of our divisions are using, but those are areas that we're going to be looking to grow in and we're really excited to share with you that we're, we wanna hear your ideas, we want to partner with you and, and we wanna be able to move electronic warfare and propel us into the future.